Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the Schuber seminar. Uh, welcome to the new edition for the 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, we're kicking off the new year with uh, with Thomas Lamb uh, telling us about a decade of uh, positroid varieties. Please go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was wondering what to talk about and and then I realized that I've been writing um, papers about positroid varieties for 10 years now. And that was very scary for me. Um, um, so, so I decided to, I decided to talk about positroid varieties. Um, yeah, so, so let me start off by sort of, I think the start off, I'll, I'll tell you what positroid varieties are and try to compare them to Schubert varieties since this is the Schubert seminar. So just to review some notation, um, uh, GRKN will be the Grassmannia of K planes in N space. It's got a stratification by Schubert cells, um, which are labeled by uh, partitions. Um, and just a reminder of what a Schubert cell is, you take so, sort of all matrices uh, that look like this, um, uh, which means that they have, I mean, there's the zeros everywhere down here. Um, they have sort of pivot uh, ones in pivot ones in specified locations, and then zeros in certain locations and some stars which are arbitrary. Um, and so uh, you look at matrices of this form and you take the image of that set inside the Grassmannian and that's the Schubert cell. And the Schubert cell is isomorphic in, in this, this particular Schubert cell is isomorphic to um, the C to the number of stars, which is seven. Um, and and the Schubert varieties are the closures of Schubert cells. Okay, hopefully that's all familiar uh, to the seminar. And so I want to spend some time defining positroid varieties, uh, which I studied uh, initially with Alan Knudsen and David Zweier. So the setting is uh, we have a K by N matrix. Okay, K by N matrix. Um, K is less than N. Um, uh, I look at the columns of this, look at the columns of this matrix, they're labeled V1, V2 up to Vn. The labeling, I'm going to extend the labeling to um, uh, integer uh, indexed um, just by labeling them periodically. And then I'm going to define a function um, from the integers to integers, and it's defined by this definition. So it will depend on my matrix, my K by N matrix. And the definition is, um, for each uh, integer i, I find the smallest uh, integer j bigger than i, such that the column vi is in the span of the next few vectors. So, so if I want to know what f of 1 is, I take v1 and I ask how many of these vectors do I need to take before v1 is in the span of them. And if I want to know what f of 2 is, I, I take v2 and I ask for it to be in the span of the next few and I see how many I need to take. Um, so let's do an example of this. Um, yeah, an example of this really small example. So this case is k equals two, n equals six, and I want to calculate. So here, I'll just do take i, f of i. So what's f of one? Um, take this vector, is it in the span of the next vector? No, um, the next vector uh, spans something zero dimensional, but uh, but V1 is in the span of V2 and V3 because V1 is a multiple of V3. So we put uh, three here. Set th th this three says that V1 is in the span of V2 and V3. Next, we look at V2 and ask when is in a span of the next few vectors, V2 is, the zero vector, so it's uh, in the span of no vectors. So it can be in this, uh, so that's a degenerate case. Um, and we define f of two is equal to two. You don't need to take any vectors and it's already in the span of them. What about V3? Um, is V3 in the span of V4? No, it's not a multiple of V4. Is it V4 and V5 are parallel, so it's also not in the span of these two, but V3 is in the span of these three. So v, uh, f of three is equal to six. Um, what about V4? V4 is P 
parallel to v5, so f of four is equal to five. Um, f of now what's f of five? It's not v5 is not uh, parallel to v6, but uh, v1 and v6 form a basis. So v5 is in the span of v6 and v1. Um, so we put a seven there because v1 uh, v1 is v7. And then um, uh, what's f of six? f of six uh, turns out to be 10. Okay. And then everything is periodic. So this uh, you can ex this is all we need to capture the information. Let me see if there are any questions. I think I was supposed to make the start of the talk especially accessible. Okay, so, so this defines a function from the integers to the integers. And the, the lemma is that this function, so this function depends on the choice of matrix V. So this function um, uh, turns out not just to be a function for integers to integers, it's a bijection. And this is not, this is not that hard to prove is just, just from the definition. Um, and it's uh, it's also periodic in this sense, um, and that just that's just because of this definition here. Um, just because the v's are indexed periodically, uh, it's something called banded, as in you uh, the way it's defined, f of i is always bigger than or equal to i by definition. It's always less than or equal to i plus n because the worst case is you have to come back to yourself before you find something that you're in the span of. So you might not, V1 might not be the span of V2, V3 or any of those things, but V1 is parallel to itself. So when you come back to yourself, you're definitely uh, in the span. Um, so this, this condition is called banded. And finally, the, the, the hardest condition to prove uh, is that, um, Assuming that this matrix this matrix is full rank, so it has rank k, then uh, the average uh, so the average increase in f is k. So so f of i minus i is how is is sort of the increase in f, um, and um, and this says that the average is k. Um, one way to think about it is to think about it as uh, the way we like to think about it sometimes is in terms of a a juggling pattern. Um, so you can picture uh, this is i, and you can picture f of i as uh, um, as as this information. Three goes to six. Four goes to five. Five goes to seven, which is here, and then six goes to ten. There's also something which goes here. Okay, so uh, this uh, this picture here, um, uh, in this case, when f of two is equal to two, I we don't usually draw anything there. Um, uh, so we call this a juggling pattern. So you can think think of this f as a juggling pattern. Um, and and this the the x axis is the time. And so at time one, you throw a ball and it lands at time three. At time three, you throw a ball and it lands at time six. And you only get to throw one ball at each time maximum. Um, and the number of balls it, that you're using in total, that's K. So if you look, if you draw, if you draw a vertical line, something like this, then you see that there are two, like this is time 4.2 or something like that. Um, there are two balls in the air. At that time, the two balls will land at time equals five and time equals six. Okay, so that's uh, that's one way to think of this uh, this equation. It says that um, it says that k, which is the rank of the matrix, is the number of balls that you are juggling. Okay. Okay, so so it's uh, it's a linear algebra exercise to prove that. For any matrix V, you will get these properties. Um, as I said, I think these um, these these are trivial. This is uh, this is fun, uh, and this is a little bit this is a little bit harder. Um, 
and and also fun. Um, this is this is pretty straightforward. That is a bijection. Okay. So uh, having made that definition, um, let me uh, write down the definition of a positroid variety. Um, so if you give me f, which is inside band k n, which is the which is the which is k n um, in words k n banded f i n permutation, so that's a uh, bijection from z to z, which satisfies those conditions from before. Um, so if you give me one of those f's, then you just look at all the matrices which have that f. And you think of those uh, you think of those matrices as points in the Grassmannian. And um, this will cut out a subset of the Grassmannian. And that's called the open positroid variety labeled by this bounded affine permutation F. Uh, so you should check that this definition of FV um, doesn't isn't changed uh, if you do row operations on the matrix V. So uh, acting with GLK uh, over here will not change will not change f of v. It will, it will preserve this. So actually, this function descends to the Grassmannian. So it's not just a function on the matrices; it's a function on the Grassmannian. And um, and the closed positive variety is the closure of this. Okay. And uh, this is these are um, so this this guy is a closed sub variety of the Grassmannian, and this guy is a locally closed sub variety. Okay, so the first uh, the first theorem says that um, there's a there's a decent analogy between the properties of these varieties and the properties of Schubert varieties. Um, so, so first of all, it's not actually quite not obvious that, uh, that these varieties pi f, so let's just refer, talk about the closed one first, um, that they're, uh, irreducible. That's not clear from the definition that they're irreducible, um, but they are, um, and the singularities of the sort of roughly same difficulty as Schubert varieties, the normal and Colin Macaulay, um, but it's not important if, if you don't know what those adjectives mean, um, Another thing I didn't write here, but let me add that is also similar to Schubert varieties is that the ideals are linearly generated. So these are the, um, uh, the ideal of a positroid variety is generated by a bunch of Pluca coordinates. Alan is making a comment. Uh, oh, it's not okay. obvious that these things are non-empty. That is true as well. Yes, it's it's also not obvious uh, uh, that they're non-empty. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so I said right. Okay. So, so the the point is back here. I said, doing some linear algebra, you can determine that any V satisfies these conditions. And what Ellen is saying is that there's a there's a harder, um, I think quite a bit harder statement, which is that anything satisfies this, um, these conditions comes from some matrix. Yes, that's 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 one level even harder than that. Yeah. Um, there's uh, uh, the the co the co-dimension of this variety is um uh, is some uh, uh, statistic on the bounded affine permutation. Um, so if you treat it as an affine permutation, then the co-dimension is the length of that affine permutation. So this is analogous to how things work in Schubert calculus as well. And also the, the third property that I wrote down here is that it's a stratification in the technical sense. So the closure, um, the closure of a, one of these open strata is a union of um, a bunch of other open strata. Um, and there are other um, other descriptions. Um, uh, so the description I gave is pretty close to a description that I usually use to sort of say what positive varieties are quickly. Is that they're uh, 
repository varieties are inter intersections of cyclically rotated Schubert varieties. Um, that's uh, that's pretty close to um, this F description I gave. There's a, a description that's not obvious. If you know what a Richardson variety is, then um, you take a Richardson variety in the uh, in the flag variety. Uh, it has a projection to a Grassmannian. If you project the Richardson uh, varieties, you'll get positroid varieties. And there's a there's another this another way to get them um, uh, by choosing a Frobenius splitting and then looking at compatibly Frobenius split subvarieties, which will all also result in the same stratification. Oh, oh so. There, there is also a question in the chat. Uh, what does it mean for G bigger than F in part three? Maybe Alan already answered. Ah uh, yes. So so I didn't want to I didn't want to spell this out. So this is the this is the Bruja order um in uh in the affine symmetric group. Um so analogous to the Bruja order you would use uh if you were comparing Schubert varieties you would use the Bruja order in a um para parabolic quotient of a symmetric group. Um, so, so it's analogous, but I'm, I'm, um, and it doesn't take that long to define. But now I'm gonna, um, but we're not gonna need to know exactly what that partial order is. And um, as I said, I since this is a Schubert seminar, I I'm in the mindset at the beginning of this talk that I want to compare positroid varieties with Schubert varieties. And one of, and if we were talking about singularities of Schubert varieties, one of the famous results, um, uh, uh due to Lakshmi and Sashadri is the um is the question of when um Schubert varieties are smooth and, and there's a pattern avoidance uh criterion for it. Um, um uh, in a in a recent work Billy and Weaver have found a criterion for smoothness of positroid varieties. So that's um also known. Okay. But uh, I think in in the Schubert seminar, one of the things that we tend to talk a lot about would be um, Schubert classes. Um, so one of the reasons why uh, Schubert varieties are so um, uh, so important is that their um, cohomology classes form a basis for the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian. Um, so the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian, yes, symmetric functions modulo some ideal. And I wrote this ideal in a um in in a way where I I said this uh ideal is generated by sure functions, um sure functions uh where the partition is not contained inside a a particular rectangle. And there are many descriptions of this ideal. Um and um the basic theorem uh connecting uh to Schubert calculus is that uh, the class of a Schubert variety maps to this distinguished class, uh, the Schur, Schur function, and they form a basis for the cohomology. Um, so uh, with this uh, comparison to Schubert varieties in mind, um, uh, back when we started looking at, at positroid varieties with Alan and David, we proved that, um, we proved that uh, positroid varieties um, their classes in the cohomology of the Grassmannian are, are the um, represented by polynomials called affine Stanley symmetric functions. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to define these affine Stanley things. So first of all, I mean, what do we need to know about affine Stanley symmetric functions? So uh, they're labeled by affine permutations and it pops out a symmetric function. It's completely combinatorially defined. So, so you can write down the monomial expansion of this, just as this is sum over all to blow. Uh, there's a formula for the affine Stanley function, which is sum over certain reduced factorizations. So, and now um, I believe there's, uh, I can mention the first open problem. I, I realized that, it, uh, so, so I mean, this, this is, as I said, this is 10 years ago, um, that we actually still do not know, or, or maybe, I mean, they, they are, um, now and then, now and then there are reports that this has been solved. I don't know the current status, but, um, 
uh, I think we still do not know the um, how to expand um, positroid classes in terms of Schubert classes, um, which is uh, since the since the Schubert classes form a basis, and these are some other um, elements in the ring, you can expand it in terms of the basis. And the expansion coefficients turns out in a sort of not completely obvious way to be equivalent to the problem of uh, Schertheim Schubert. And this is the fact that it's equivalent to this Schertheim Schubert problem is basically this uh, this other description of positroid variety as projections of Richardson varieties. Um, and the Schertheim and um, and it contains uh, uh, the the solved problem of um, uh, the structure constants of the quantum cohomology of the Grassmannian. So certainly the um, uh, the expansion coefficients expanding positroid classes in terms of Schubert classes is an interesting is an interesting problem. And maybe we are not that far from maybe we're not that far from solving this. Okay. So 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 everything so far I've said. Um, is sort of trying to trying to um, put positroid varieties in parallel with Schubert varieties, and um, uh, and that's certainly the um, uh, point of view uh, we had in the beginning. Um, uh, but of course, this uh, this result here says that um, they're not quite as I mean the I mean this result it's clear from this result that they're not quite as natural. As Schubert varieties, Schubert varieties are more natural because they their classes give a basis, and it's the basis that we, for a lot of reasons, this basis is the correct one to be working with. And positroid classes give a bunch of other symmetric functions. So, um, uh, so in uh, in recent years, I felt that a better analogy, um, than comparing the positroid stratification of the Grassmannian. To the Schubert stratification is to compare the positroid stratification of the Grassmannian with the torus orbit closure stratification of a uh, projective toric variety. So this is my notation of a of for a toric variety. And so, um, uh, what do we need to know about a projective toric variety? Um, a projective toric variety uh, is um, you. Uh, I'll label it by uh, lattice polytope. So this guy here is a lattice polytope. Um, and it comes with a stratification. And uh, the stratification of the toric variety, um, uh, the strata are in bijection um, with the faces of this polytope. Um, and everything is glued together with closures imitating the, um, the uh, face poset of the polytope. Um, so, uh, so if the face is bigger, um, if the face is bigger, then the uh, then the corresponding stratum is bigger, and so on. And um, and this stratification is obtained by taking the dense torus of the toric variety, acting and looking at the torus orbit closures. Um, and uh, reasons. Here's a, here's a list of reasons why I think. Um, this is a good analogy, so that you should think of the positive stratification of the Grassmannian as some analog of the torus or orbit closure stratification of the uh, of the uh, of a toric variety. Um, I already said Frobenius splitting, um, uh, and and yeah, I, and I don't want to go in that direction too much. But um, if you know about that, then there's an analogy there. I'm going to spend some time talking about. Uh, the fact that the boundary, uh, um, the the positroid divisors form a canonical divisor in the Grassmannian, and also the um, the uh, toric divisors of a toric variety also form a canonical divisor in the um, in a toric variety. Um, and there's also uh, this notion of positive geometry, which is a little bit stronger than what I just said. And the other reasons, um, uh, mirror symmetry, where um, the positive stratification seems to correspond. Um, this seems to be the right analogy in mirror symmetry, and also um, uh, relations to cluster algebras, where this also seems to be the right analogy. Um, recall that a uh, cluster variety is made by um, gluing a lot of tori together, and and of course our toric variety is also made by gluing a lot of tori together. Um, oh, Anti-canonical. Uh, sorry. Yes. Anti-canonical. 
anti-canonical. Thank you. Um, so I I may have said canonical earlier when I meant anti-canonical divisor. The boundary, um, the positroid divisors in the Grassmannian form an anti-canonical divisor in the Grassmannian. Um, oh, so as I wrote this slide, I realized that I don't know how to solve uh, this problem down here, um, uh, which I've actually never thought about uh, until I wrote this slide. So I said, I said when back here, when uh, ten years ago, when I was working on this with Ellen and David, uh, we wanted to write all these. We wanted to look at all these symmetric functions, these F. I. Stanley symmetric functions, and they represent positroid classes, and we want to express them into the Schubert classes. But if the correct analogy is with uh, uh, with a toric variety, then maybe I should, instead of presenting the cohomology of the Grassmannian as with the Schubert basis and have these extra other elements floating around, I should have the cohomology of the Grassmannian be generated by positroid classes and write down a bunch of relations that positroid classes satisfy. And that would be a little bit analogous to how we uh, often think about the cohomology ring of a, um, or, or a chow ring of a toric variety. Um, we, it's generated by it's generated by the um, divisors, and then you uh, and then you write down a bunch of relations using some linear algebra data on the corresponding rays. Um, so um, anyway, I haven't actually thought about this, but but this uh, but I'm I'm curious if there is a way to present this uh, this ring, um, knowing about positroid classes instead of knowing about Schubert classes. Okay, so so why why do I now think um, uh, the analogy is better? Um, and and one of the most potent ways to think about it is this notion of positive geometry. Um, so uh, so a toric variety a toric variety has a dense torus, and the dense torus has a positive part. So let's write down what all these things are. So it contains. Uh, just by definition of being a toric variety, contains a dense torus. And if you look at the real points of the dense torus, it contains uh, a positive part where you just take the, the first the real points. And then for the real points, you, you choose one of the two connected components and you call it positive. Um, and then you get some positive torus. So this is some kind of positive torus sitting inside. Um, this thing, the positive part of the toric variety, or non-negative part of the toric variety, is the closure of this inside uh, the toric variety. Um, and um, and this thing, um, uh, you find in um, uh, Fulton's book on introduction to toric varieties, a proof that actually this thing is uh, diffeomorphic to a polytope. In fact, diffeomorphic to this 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 polytope that you started with. Um, so, uh, sitting inside the toric variety, which is a complex algebraic variety, um, is uh, uh, is something that actually looks like a polytope, uh, a topological space that looks like a polytope. Um, and it turns out that there's uh, there's also um, something going on um, in the Grassmannian in a similar way. So, if you take the Grassmannian. Um, you can define the total non-negative part of it, which was uh, defined by Lustig and Posnikov, um, which is the locus where all the Pluca coordinates are, are non-negative. So this defines a subspace of the Grassmannian. It's a semi-algebraic subspace. Um, and uh, so i uh, advertise these two theorems. Um, one is that... Uh, this this is not a I mean this is not a polytope, but the uh but it's uh um as a stratified space it's pretty much as close to a polytope as you can get. Um, it's a regular CW complex homeomorphic to a closed bore. So, um, regular CW complex uh, means that it's uh it's a stratified space. The the strata are these cells, and the closure of each of the stratum strata is itself a closed bore. So it's uh it's it's Every piece is a closed bore. So it looks, uh, um, uh, in, if you draw a picture of it, it basically looks like a picture of a polytone. Um, 
And, uh, and a stronger uh, stronger statement is that it's a positive geometry. And this is related to, um, uh, I mean, so uh, a statement, uh, sorry, uh, the statement that it's a positive geometry is, uh, is stronger than what, what I said before, that it's got an, uh, it has an anti-canonical, the boundary is an, boundary divisor is an anti-canonical divisor. So let me write down what the, what this definition says. Um, so they exist. A um a top form called the canonical form omega of this thing with only simple poles along the boundary divisors, and when you take the residues you get a recursion. Okay, so this is a little bit, uh, uh, sketchy. So the so the first thing to say is that in this CW um, stratification of the totally non-negative Grossmannian, the strata are given by intersecting this totally non-negative Grossmannian with the positroid stratification. Okay, so I didn't say that. I should have said that. And over here, this thing is isomorphic to a polytope. Uh, in the toric variety case, uh, the non-negative part is uh, diffeomorphic to a polytope, and the um, phase stratum stratification of the polytope is obtained by intersecting with torus orbit closure. So, so the two strata provide these topological spaces with their natural face uh, stratification. Um, and uh, the statement of uh, to be a positive geometry says that there is a top form, which means the um, uh, uh, a differential form of degree equal to the dimension. Um, uh, so in this case, this this top form would be k by n minus k. That's the dimension of the Grossmannian. And it's supposed to, and the feature of it is that it has pole, poles at exactly the same places as the complex um, stratification has strata. So it has its polar strata, sorry, its, its polar uh, behavior is identical to that of this, uh, of this stratified space. So wherever you've got a facet of your, um, of your regular CW complex, it's got a pole. If you take a pole along there, you get another differential form and that will have poles along the uh, facets of that uh, um, stratum and so on. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit stronger. I mean, if from the algebraic geometry perspective, it seems pretty close to um, saying that there is a, I mean, saying that the divisor is a canonical, is an anti-canonical divisor, then there will be a, then there'll be some um, section of the canonical bundle which has uh, which has um, sort of sim simple poles along the boundary, um, but this is a little bit stronger because it asks for a form, and eventually you get down to a point, and you want the residues all to be one. So that's part of the definition of a positive geometry.